many are calling the Hamas attack on Israel last weekend, on Shabbat, by the way, and during the Simchat Torah celebration, they're calling it Israel's 9-11. The events of last Saturday morning really represent Israel's greatest military and, and intelligence failure in 50 years, perhaps in the 75 years of the country's existence. And I don't know what accounts for that, but it was obvious that this was a planned attack that was to take place in the exact time frame of the Yom Kippur War 50 years earlier, almost exactly 50 years earlier. And because Israel, the nation, is one of the closest allies to the United States of America, and because this is the connection I want you to really get, because Christianity is Jewish. You have to remember that. Because Christianity is Jewish, I want to answer some logical questions about this event that we as believers should consider. And so let's pause and look to the Lord in word of prayer. And then uh, three questions I want to uh, consider with you tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together tonight. And I pray that you'll use these thoughts to uh, just really instruct us and encourage us and empower us in these dark times that we're living in. Lord, I'm grateful that you give us all the light and all the hope that we can possibly need or even expect. You give it to us in the form of your word and the living spirit of God in us. We're praising you for it. We ask that you'll just use this time that we have together tonight to not bring attention to us, but rather to bring attention to you, to glorify you, and to make us more like you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first question I think we ought to uh, talk about, and this probably has entered your mind, does this have any prophetic fulfillment, what's going on? Does this fulfill prophecy in any way? Because I'm telling you, it's so easy to equate this with the fulfillment of prophecy because of the, the carnage and the atrocities that have been perpetrated. And the simple answer is no. This is not fulfillment of prophecy. But I want you to realize a couple of things. I want you to realize, first of all, these current events, this present situation, What's happening now is actually setting the stage for future prophetic fulfillment, okay? This is not the fulfillment of prophecy, but it's setting the table, and it's uh, building a platform for future prophetic fulfillment. The lines are being drawn for a prophesied coalition of nations who will attack Israel, nations like Syria. Iran, and uh, Russia. And haven't you even wondered, because we don't know, where China fits into all of this? Because, you know, in Revelation 16, there is a vast uh, million-man army that moves from the east. So, present circumstances, present and current events, are actually drawing the lines for future prophecy to be fulfilled. But I also want to say this. While what's going on and, and what has happened and what is going on right now does not fulfill Bible prophecy, it does point to the future. This current war, you might say, provides us a glimpse into prophetic future when there will be a time, if you think this is bad, a time of unparalleled carnage 
that the nation of Israel will face. For example, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' words, it's called uh, uh, the, uh, it's the Olivet Discourse. And here's what he says about a future time that has not yet happened. He says, for then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. Everyone would be wiped out. But for the elect's sake, the elect meaning Israel, those days shall be shortened. So this current war provides a glimpse into the prophetic future time of unparalleled carnage that the nation of Israel faces. In fact, the prophet Zechariah says in chapter 13 and verse 8, that when it is all done, only one-third of the world's Jewish population will have survived. I checked. There's something like 15.2 million Jewish people in the world today. Just round it off to 15 million. That means 10 million Jewish people will be wiped out if there were 15 million. There probably will be much more than that during that time period that's yet future. And so we're talking amazing, amazing. That's what lies in the future for the nation of Israel. Here's the second question. Not only does this fulfill prophecy, but my second question is this. Should believers support Israel? Now, that might seem like a, a, a nonsensical question to people like us here at Bethel. But you know what? That's an that's a important question for believers, not only here in America, but for all over the world. Because more and more believers are not supporting Israel. So, answer the question. Should believers support Israel? And if so, why? Well, very simply, to begin with, because of the ancient and the continual connection of the nation of Israel to the true God. Romans 11 says it a couple of times in, in different words, but here's the meaning. Is God done with Israel? Has God just cast them away forever? Has he washed his hands of Israel? Is he done with them? Or, or is, it, is there no hope for them? And over and over again, Romans chapter 11 says, no, 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 no. God's not done with them. Because of that ancient and continual connection to the true and living God, because he covenanted, chose them, and made a covenant with them. That's the basis. He chose them. Why did he choose them? <laughs> it's interesting that uh, the answer that we get to that question, he says, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, that is the covenant he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In fact, he says in Jeremiah chapter uh, 31 and uh, verse 3, <clears throat> this is, a, I think, probably a familiar verse. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee, notice this, with an everlasting love. Everlasting never ends. Therefore, with loving kindness, that's the Hebrew word chesed, uh, the, the faithful love of God. With loving kindness have I drawn thee. So why should Christians support Israel? Because God chose them. God chose them. 
And another reason is because God chose them to make them a channel of blessing to the entire world. They are the means of world redemption, we might say. In chapter 12 of Genesis, where God calls the father of the Jewish people, Abraham, he says to him in verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and uh, thou shalt be a blessing. And he says, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How's that going to happen? Well, it's going to happen because not only has God chosen Israel, but he has chosen them to be the conduit or the channel of redemption for the entire human race, for all peoples of all times of human history. How does he do that? (laughs) You know, if it wouldn't be for the Jewish people, you and I wouldn't have a Bible. If it wouldn't be for the Jewish people, you and I wouldn't have a Messiah. We know about the Messiah because we have a Bible, and this is a Jewish scripture, and uh, our Messiah is a Jewish Messiah. And so why should we support Israel? Because they have an ancient and a continual connection to the true God who made an oath, a covenant promise to their fathers and chose them because of his unconditional love and made them the channel through which world redemption would come. And uh, he, he promised that he would bless them. Genesis 12 again, verse 2, I will bless you. And then he promises to preserve them. Again, back in Jeremiah chapter 31. He basically says this, that the permanence of uh, the cycles in nature and the immeasurableness of heaven and earth guarantee the survival of the Jewish people. Just as the sun rises and sets, just as the moon shines every night, God is going to keep his promise and preserve the nation of Israel. In fact, in Romans 11 again, where the question is asked, is God done with them? Is God done with them? No, no way. In fact, he says, the covenant and promise of God are without repentance. That means they can't ever be changed. They are irrevocable. God will not revoke those promises. He will not revoke that covenant. So, That's why we should support Israel. Well, how, though? How should believers support Israel? Well, I think, first of all, you need the right perspective. You need a perspective of Israel that's biblical. You know what God says about the nation of Israel? You can say whatever you want about them. You can make your jokes about them, right? You can uh, can look down on them. But you know what God says about them? He says, they are the apple of my eye. You know what the apple of the eye is? It's the pupil. It's that black dot in the center of your eye. God says, that's what Israel is to me, the apple of my eye. And if you touch Israel, you're poking your finger in the eye of God, so to speak. That's a biblical perspective. So beware, folks. And don't buy into and don't accept popular replacement theology. It is the teaching in many mainline denominations that God's done with Israel and the church replaces Israel and uh, gobbles up all the promises that God made to them. That's replacement theology. That is not a biblical Uh, perspective. So how can you support Israel? By having a biblical biblical perspective. I think a second way is by being a witness. 
We are told in Romans chapter 11 that one of the responsibilities that we have towards Jewish people is to provoke them to jealousy, to have a life that uh, speaks volumes to them, that causes them to see, you know, you have something that I need. I don't have it. I need that that Jewish Messiah Yeshua, that you say you believe in, well, he's made a vast difference in your life. We're to provoke them to jealousy. We're to be a testimony to them. We're to take opportunities as they arise, divine appointments to witness to them. And as someone has said, we are to love them to life in Jesus, the Messiah. Interesting. I didn't get a chance to go uh, into it with him because I was standing in the post office line uh, waiting to mail a package. And I got up to, uh, uh, I I was just getting up to the window and there was this man behind me and uh, we got talking and I realized he was Jewish. You know, he, he told me his name. I said, oh, that's a Jewish name. Are you Jewish? And he said, yes. I said, oh, you know, that's wonderful because God has given me a special love for Jewish people. And uh, and here's why. And then I had to mail my package. But anyway, uh, it's just opportunities that God gives us naturally. And I think a third way in which we can support Israel is by blessing them. How do you bless them? Well, I'm sure the Lord can give you creative ways to bless them. Um, one way uh, may be uh, through some means of supplying during this time that they're going through, but obviously by praying for them, right? Praying for God to remove the veil from their heart that they might see the truth and believe. Uh, Paul said, you know what my heart's desire is? You know what my prayer to God is? That Israel be saved. So you can bless them by praying for them. You can bless them by encouraging them uh, through your kindness to them. Uh, I think a fourth way in which we can support Israel, how how do you do that? You can stand with Israel. You can resist any form of anti-Semitism. You realize that if you don't speak up against anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is an attack on our brothers and sisters in Christ, too. We have Jewish people right here tonight. And if we just if we don't stand with our Jewish with the Jewish people, then we, in a way, betray also our our dearest brothers and sisters in the Lord that are Jewish. Here's the third point. Third question. We just asked and answered to some degree, does what's happening, does this fulfill prophecy? Should Christians support Israel? Thirdly, you ready? How do you treat Palestinians? I think there's a twofold approach. If you were here when I read Grant's uh, email, you got a little bit of a taste of what I'm going to say. Number one, you have to, first of all, have anger. Not all anger is wrong. There's righteous anger. So I think you should have a godly anger, not a not a fleshly anger, but a godly anger. By that I mean I don't think that you should deny or diminish evil deeds that people perpetrate. And I think it's right not for us as individuals to take vengeance, but it's right for a country to defend their citizens. In fact, that's what nations are really supposed to do, defend their citizens, not pay all, the, not pay all their bills, but uh, defend their safety, give them protection. So 
a godly anger. Evil has to be identified, and it ought to be denounced, and it ought to be dealt with by the proper authorities. We're not vigilantes, but proper authorities have the powers. God's word gives nations the power to wreak justice where that is necessary. We ought to also recognize God's redemptive purposes, that a righteous indignation, a righteous anger will not lead to hate. It'll lead to love. In fact, you remember how Jesus puts it there in Matthew chapter 5, where he says, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Godly anger does not lead to hate. It leads to love. It leads to a fervent love for souls who desperately need Jesus. We need to see our enemies through the eyes of the Lord. And when Jesus hung on that cross and his enemies were mocking him and they had done everything that they could, they were killing him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And God can enable us to have the grace to forgive and to evangelize people that hate us and want to do us in. And that is the only thing that will ever transform a life. That kind of love expressed in the gospel, that will transform a life which will stop terrorism and bring peace. I want to, in closing, remind you of this illustration from the life of uh, Corey Ten Boom. You're familiar with this in her amazing book, The The Hiding Place. Of course, she worked against the Nazis secretly during World War II in her home country of Holland. And she hid, her and her family hid Jews uh, in their upstairs uh, uh, secret space. But she was caught, of course, as well as her father, her sister, And they were sent to a a Nazi concentration camp where they suffered uh, just unimaginably. They suffered. And um, she says, of course, her father died in that concentration camp at the hands of the Nazis. And uh, she said, it was at a church service in Munich that I saw him. The former SS man who had stood guard at the shower door in the processing center at Ravensbrook. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, my sister Betsy's pain blanched face. He came up to me as the church was emptying beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that, as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who preach so often to the people uh, of the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer, Jesus, I can't forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, 
while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it's not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but it's on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command, the very love itself. I thought that was a tremendous illustration of what I was trying to say in relationship to how we are to treat Palestinians.